folks. This is Rob Evans, Vermont School Safety Liaison Officer. We're going to give it a few more minutes for additional folks to sign on, uh, and then we'll get started with our conference call. Hello? Hi, this is, uh, this is Rob Evans, uh, the School Safety Liaison Officer. We'll start the uh, conference call in about another two minutes. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Rob Evans again. I'm a Vermont School Safety Liaison Officer, and this is the conference call to do some lessons learned and, and uh, discuss the, the Montpelier shooting uh, on the Montpelier High School campus. 
wanted to remind folks, if you could, to please go into the mute mode so you don't disturb the, uh, the participants in the call. Uh, I'm joined uh, here on the conference call with Ms. Emily Harris from the Vermont uh, Emergency Management, Matt Nisley, who's the school resource officer for the Montpelier School District, Chief Tony Fagos, who's the chief of the Montpelier Police Department, uh, Superintendent Brian Ripka uh, will be joining the call. Um, he's the superintendent of the Montpelier School District and Principal Mike McGrath uh, from the uh, Montpelier High School. I'm here. Okay, Mike. This is Mike McGrath. Yep. Yep. So just uh, wanted to remind folks uh, about a couple of resources at the beginning of the call um, that are available for your, your school safety or emergency preparedness. One is the, is, is the Twitter feed that is hosted uh, by the Vermont School Safety Center. And that Twitter feed, if you haven't joined, you can follow us at uh, VTED underscore safe schools. So that's Victor Tom Edward David underscore safe schools. You can follow us on Twitter, or you can uh, access all of these uh, school emergency preparedness resources on the uh, Vermont School Safety Center's what website at schoolsafety.vermont.gov. So I want to remind folks again to put their phones in mute mode if you can. And I'm going to turn the call over to uh, Chief Fakos to give a high-level overview uh, of the incident. We will not be going into specific details uh, about um, the shooting. It, this is more of a high-level um, conversation about um, the law enforcement response and then the crisis response actions that were taking, uh, taken at the school. And certainly due to the sensitivity of the ongoing uh, investigation and those types of things, we won't be getting into specific details. If folks would like to uh, ask questions during the call, uh, you can text me at 802-839-0448. Again, that's 802-839-0448. Or you can email me your questions at revans at margolishealy.com. Again, that's revans margolishealy.com. Okay, Tony? Sure. So back on uh, Tuesday, January 16th, uh, around 9.30 in the morning, there was an armed robbery at the credit union, Monte Place Credit Union, located on Bailey Avenue, right across from out the back door to meet with a family off of campus when the call came in um, and due to the proximity of the school my initial concern obviously was that something could spill over into the school or um, into the school property so my my thought at that point was to keep it out of the school keep whatever the threat was outside the school um, so I got in my cruiser because it's across the street uh, the bank is across the street from the school um, and began to drive around the back of the school. At that point, we received information that someone was running down the bike, the person was running down the bike path, which is directly behind the school and, and right against school grounds. Um, <clears throat> as soon as I pulled around the back of the school, I saw the individual described and waited for a minute outside the school to make sure he was not turning toward the school to keep that threat outside. At the same time, I'm, I was calling dispatch to get in contact with the school to lock the school down, um, knowing what was happening at that point. Um, as I saw the person in the trajectory that looked like it would carry him past the school, I that kind of changed hats at that point into in trying to go catch this guy and make sure that it, he wasn't going to trip back towards the school, and I chased him down and, and contained him at that point. So from there, uh, as uh, Corporal Nisley said, he was contained. He was still he was on school grounds, um, and the school was in lockdown. And at that point, also, we brought in additional law enforcement resources um, to, to try to, uh, again, peacefully resolve this. And, and a lot of resources were going to be needed and certainly did arrive. So the next, at some point, 
baseline tape around around the entire school. So it was it was it was a distraction for some of the perimeter uh, officers there. But but again, it was something that was a concern. Uh, as the situation unfolded, I had very limited communication at first with uh, with the school officials and. Uh, but again, what was important for me was knowing that the school was really in a very safe mode. Because not only was it was it secure and locked down, they were aware of what was happening to a certain extent on the outside. But also, all students and faculty were moved away from what would have been could have been, you know, harm's way from any uh, potential gunfire on that side of the building. Chief, a, qu a quick question for you. No, knowing that you had your internal Montpelier Police Department response, as far as calling for mutual aid for, you know, you've got a potentially critical incident that's taking place, uh, don't know where the threat is going to go. Tell me about the notification for additional resources and, and how, how your pre-planning played a role that folks are going where they should be, the communications are established and those types of things. Sure. Uh, very early on, I specifically requested uh, the, with, through the Vermont State Police, the tactical services and crisis negotiation units of, of the Vermont State Police, because this was an armed situation. Uh, we have a local MOU in Washington County, uh, so we also had Washington County Sheriff's Department uh, arrived. We had also two other state agencies on, three others. We had Fish and Wildlife uh, arrived. We had. DMV law enforcement was there and liquor control, uh, and everybody just kind of came together. We all one of the things we're fortunate in Vermont is that we all train together for these types of situations. So it didn't really matter, uh, you know, what what the shoulder patch uh, was. And then we kind of as those resources kept arriving, we started then uh, changing gears a little bit because we had traffic to contend with, and our public works was called. To start shutting down first the first thing we did shut down was the bike path because that would that goes along the river behind the Montpelier High School um, and that was the first the first uh, road that was closed and then eventually we closed down uh, Memorial Drive we had to do evacuations on Lower State Street so if you on the river um, again the concern uh, for because this was an armed armed situation so law enforcement wise that's what we're putting in place also, um, we staged Montpelier uh, ambulance service was was on the grounds as well, um, on standby in a safe location. And one of the lessons learned there, uh, in talking to the deputy chief, was giving what the potential could have been was to have it beyond just one ambulance, which is kind of our standard response to stack some ambulances up just in case, uh, even though we only have one suspect. But um, again, it was a very dangerous situation for. For all those involved, and, and Chief, so you had a you had an active crime scene at one location, and then right across the street, you've got this ongoing incident as well. So you've got not only the, the school that's 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 in a threatening position, but you don't know what you know the depth of what you've got going on at, at the credit credit union as well. Was it a challenge at time to to prioritize responses and where you flow resources to, and what's the most important thing to get to? Tell, tell us a little bit about that. Sure, absolutely. Uh, you know, all the resources were focused on on the immediate uh, contained threat at that at that moment. Uh, we did have communication with dispatch and the credit union that we would have uh, an officer uh, making contact with them as soon as as soon as possible. Uh, and as this thing continued to unfold, eventually it it overwhelmed our resources. Uh, that also we had to have um, eventually. Vermont State Police took the investigated the bank robbery for us later on uh, because we just didn't have the resources to, to to deal with everything that had to be done. Uh, but we did have a at one point we did have an officer make contact uh, with the bank. But there again, the first bank was was safe. They were they had closed temporarily um, following their own protocol, and until we were able to uh, send investigative resources to them. So Matt and Chief Whit. From the Incident Command Unified Command perspective, you've got a school that's in lockdown, so all the executive leadership is, is in lockdown, and now law enforcement is on pretty much the, the exterior perimeter of the building. 
in your opinion, was it a challenge at times communicating, or had you pre-planned that if this type of thing took place, how you're going to communicate to let folks know that this situation is not coming in towards the school? How did you work that process? Well, quite frankly, we didn't have, uh, it's not something we specifically had tested or trained for in this, this scenario. Um, but again, I, I, knowing from my perspective, uh, from the law enforcement command that we had established outside in the initial phase of this, uh, I knew the school was safe and, and that um, the school administration w was essentially waiting to hear I uh, made contact with us directly. Uh, about uh, almost just less than an hour into the event, we made the decision to, uh, to move uh, incident command from outside the parking lot. Uh, I moved it to inside the superintendent's office, which is right in the Montpelier High School itself. And from the, as we were waiting for the necessary equipment and specialized units to help resolve, uh, you know, for the negotiation and, and the tactical support. So that was, at that point, was really the, the first opportunity that I had to directly uh, speak with, um, you know, Superintendent Brian Ricca and, and uh, as far as some of the next steps. And, and, <clears throat> and this is something we have talked about in our safety planning meetings with the school. Um, you know, they know that law enforcement is coming and that, that their job at that point is to be in lockdown until we come to them. Um, so this is something that we've talked about, the way the communication is going to work. Um, it doesn't always feel great as a school administrator to have to wait for that information. Um, and part of the delay in the communication there is our dispatch was also overwhelmed with 911 calls due to the robbery. Um, so it, it did slow our communication at that point where the school's trying to get information, we're trying to get information to them about why they're locking down. Um, and it, it, it just is delayed because of the emergency calls coming into our dispatch center. I could add too, as far as communication, uh, once I had time allowed, I was able to get a message into the Montpelier city manager uh, advising what was going on. And we have um, somebody that could also get uh, some word out, which we, the city was able to do and then also a preliminary message that was also uh, sent out within the school communication system as notifying parents of the, so that part was able to happen um, it, all things considered I think fairly quickly anyway. So Corporal, you had mentioned that you talked about this a little bit in your school safety meetings. Could you talk about those meetings, how frequently they're held, what sorts of things you discuss during them and how beneficial they are? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, we, it, you know, my, my position as a school resource officer it allows me to be in and meet with the schools quite regularly about current trends in school safety, about where our planning is at, about what's going to happen and what's most likely to happen and what we'll have to plan for. Um, being all in the, on the same page with law enforcement and our fire department sits on those meetings as well. So the school knows what we're going to be doing. We know what the school is going to be doing. Um, is is critical when something like this comes up. Tony, this, this incident sounds awful familiar to like the, the Essex response last year where, uh, again, school executive leadership teams are inside the school, responding law enforcement is on the outside of the school and making sure that those systems, again, are in place to be able to communicate, whether that's a text messaging group or portable radios or you know, we're just calling that, that superintendent or principal directly just so that we, we have a, 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 a sense of being informed about what the process is and what's taking place outside the school and when it's safe for them to do so, immediately having the opportunity to establish unified command, which it seems that that's exactly what you did is once the threat is now gone, now we bring the participating stakeholders together to start up the unified command process. Superintendent Ricca, can you can you key in a little bit on on the notifications from law enforcement and then the decision making process internally inside the school? Absolutely. Um, as I said in our previous after action report, which I think took place in 2012, when we had um, another situation that turned out to be a hoax, um, the importance and emphasis on relationships cannot be emphasized enough throughout the course of this call. Um, Corporal Nisley was obviously engaged directly with the alleged suspect at the time. 
but anytime I'm able to see Tony Fakus walking through the door or Neil Martell or any of the faces of our first responders who we know by first name and regularly interact and work with, it brings an immediate sense of relief um, to someone like me who is not trained in law enforcement. Um, I know my role in a unified command. Um, I know what cues to take from unified command. Um, and I'm very comfortable um, waiting on the periphery and engaging and staying out of the way and only engaging when need be. Um, I did check in with um, Chief Fakus at what I thought was an appropriate time because we had been getting some messages from um, school board members who had been getting messages from their children, most of which were substantially inaccurate. Um, and Tony and I know each other well enough that I can give him a look and say, is it appropriate for me to send out a power school message now? And he very quickly gave me a nod, and then I was out of the way. There was a lull, or at least a brief, um, I'd say, respite from the radio chatter. Um, and so I took that opportunity just to check in very briefly with Chief. Um, I knew exactly what I was able to say. Um, so I don't have my timeline in front of me, but I do know we got a message out to folks that essentially said that we had a situation taking place at Montpelier High School, that the high school was in lockdown, but that all students were accounted for and were safe because the danger was outside of the building. And I also mentioned, and I think this is important for um, takeaways to, to go forward for folks, I also mentioned the status of the other two buildings. And part of that is internal work that we've come to as, as a group, our leadership team, if we have an incident at our at one of our buildings, the other two buildings are alerted, and based on the fact that the danger was contained only at Montpelier High School, no change in status was made at Union Elementary School or Main Street Middle School, other than for their principal and administrative assistant to know um, that our status was on lockdown. Brian, a quick question for you. In, in your mass notifications, just to, you know, I know you don't have the timeline right there in front of you, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, uh, and, and then <coughs> were there, were there follow-up messages that you did throughout the process, and was 211 used at all in any of this? Um, I want to say, and I, I can look back and confirm once, once we're off the call, I want to say I got a message out somewhere between 10.30 and 11 o'clock um, and a follow-up went out when the incident was over around noon. Um, and then as, as Tony alluded to, we, we recognize that due to the lack of staff in MPS, and I say this in my school safety letter that goes home um, in the summer, that I will not be reaching out to families until, one, I can be assured by our law enforcement personnel that it is a safe time for me to do so, and number two, that I actually have information to share. And as um, I'm not sure if it was Tony or Matt noted, you know, sometimes it's going to mean that, that um, parents are a little uncomfortable. They're not getting all the information ahead of time. Um, but as anybody who's done one of these uh, robocalls, it, it's not as easy as just picking up your phone and doing it. You do have to be thoughtful. I always want to be sure that I'm um, only sharing appropriate information based on what, in this case, Chief Fakus told me was okay to say. Um, those things take priority rather than the urgency of responding to half-truths that are coming out either on um, social media, um, in this case, WCAX was there and was covering it, and in some cases, our own students were texting, were texting their families. Brian, I, I appreciate you saying that, and I, and I think, you know, your colleagues that, that dealt with the Fairhaven incident last week had, had to draw that fine line between, you know, when, when do you get the information, who do you share it with, and, and is that going to have a negative impact on an ongoing investigation, and, and what can you release and how you should release? Those are conversations that need to happen with law enforcement, but the priority, a number one priority, is the safety of our kids, and, and there may be times where parents, like you said, are in that uncomfortable position of just not knowing, 
but I, I think, Brian, it's, it's an education as well of the parents that, that that type of thing may happen in the future, that there may be 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, because the school is focused on safety and security of, of the campus community, that maybe we aren't able to get communications out to the parents and that type of thing. And I, you know, as I said, Rob, I, I own that in the beginning. I learned that the hard way from the first incident that we went through that ended up being a hoax. And based on that experience, I share very readily that I will only be able to get you information, A, when I can be assured that it's a safe time for me to do it, and B, once, once I am in agreement with law enforcement as to what information can go out. And, and um, you know, each school district and supervisory union is going to have to make their own assessment um, based on their unique situation, their staffing, and their relationship with law enforcement. But um, in MPS since 2012, I've been very candid with folks, and, um, and I think it's as long as people are aware of what they can expect. I think, you know, superintendents, school leadership needs to be sharing, this is what you can expect. You know, and I do know other um, school districts and supervisory unions do have enough personnel, and some can, as long as it's been cleared with law enforcement, some can get some information out more readily or more quickly than others. Um, but I know as a parent, I, I live in Williston, and I know the expectations um, as a parent if there is a situation happening at Williston Central School where my children are. I know when to expect information and, and what that school's expectations are about getting information out to us. Um, so I think my main message is as long as, as school leadership is clear about who will be sending out the messages and what their timeline will potentially be based on their interaction with law enforcement and based on the uniqueness of each situation, they simply need to share that um, and the rationale with families well in advance of any of these situations taking place. Thanks, Brian. We'll take a quick break. It, again, if folks want to uh, want to ask some questions, you can text me at 802-839-0448 or email me at revans at margolishealy.com. And just as a reminder uh, to those participating, this, this is being recorded, and we will share a link of this conversation. So if there are folks that were not able to attend, you can share this link with them, and they can reap the benefits of the, uh, the candid conversations. Mike, if you're if you're still on, yep. can you can you talk um, um, from the student notification process yeah. and the initial communications and how effective mm -hmm. was that and maybe yeah. some of the training and, and exercising that you have done in the past to ensure that you know when it happened that day your, your students and faculty and staff were prepared to respond appropriately. Yeah, thanks. Um, so you know, I think there's some things that uh, I would recommend and some things. Um, that I think went well, so I'll just speak to those a little bit. I would say, first of all, um, you know, we we do our homework uh, in the sense that we we're diligent about doing those drills every month and uh, meeting as a, a safety team and crisis team. So I think that you know, when the real thing's happening, you just naturally default to what you've practiced, and so I think it's important that you are um, practicing and being conscious in those practices. Uh, about what's effective and what isn't. So there was um, some muscle memory to, to go to, which was really helpful. And then um, I would say I got a lot of, um, on the positive side of things, I got a lot of positive feedback about the amount of communication uh, that I provided the kids and the faculty. And I would say that, you know, as a communicator, we want to be clear, we want to be decisive, we don't want to add any kind of extra details or any kind of gossip or anything along those lines or anything that would interfere with an investigation or uh, an active situation. And so we want to steer clear of all those things, but we also want to be honest. I think you know sometimes people's minds um, can create more chaos than the truth. And so um, I was trying to be as clear and decisive as possible, um, and, and I was updating um, kids, not a lot, but when I thought it was appropriate. Um, and I think those are the kinds of things that, you know, we have to be willing to react to the situation, too. I think we're learning from, from Alice and this, um, these incidents uh, that 
are terrible, you know, terrible incidents that are happening around the country that you want to be well trained, but you also want to be able to react in the moment. So I think one of the ways that I deviated from any kind of um, specific plan we ever had was because you know we were so secure with the police here so quickly, there really was room for me to be able to visit the the rooms and just check in with kids and adults um, on an individual basis, and and I did that. And we moved kids away from uh, the side of the building, as the um, Chief Fakos had, had uh, shared. And, you know, that wasn't something that we had practiced, but it was a practical thing to do. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, because of cell phones, there's just a reality there that um, kids are texting each other like crazy, even when we ask them not to, you know, they... They, there's just so many devices in any given building in the modern world. And, you know, they're, they're watching it on WCX. Of course, we discouraged that, and teachers were great about not having mu too much of that, but it was still happening. And so if I can keep up with that, at least on some level of saying, yes, this is happening, yes, we're okay, yes, we're moving over here, um, yes, everything's locked, <laughs> uh, I think that those are important things to do to just be um, – communicated as much as possible, and a, a lot of positive feedback um, from that side of things. And the other thing that we did is when um, the immediate threat uh, was over, uh, we had an assembly. We just asked the kids to come down to, to the assembly and so that I could just see them eye to eye and say, yes, this happened, um, and here's what's going to happen this afternoon. And, you know, we worked with... Uh, the authorities to say, all right, well, we're going to try to get lunch still, and made it, made a practical um, decision to keep kids in house through the end of the day, which I think added a tremendous amount of normalcy that we needed, and and which was supported by Brian's messages to the parents uh, using the Alert Now system to not come and pick up their kids. That that actually would have been um, more chaotic and disruptive for for everyone. Um, so we didn't do that. Last thing I'll say about communication is once uh, the day was over, um, I sent an email out to all the families and all the students around 5 or 6 p.m., which was really just along the lines of, yes, this was a really big day for us. Thank you to, um, to the authorities. Thank you to all the kids that did a great job. And, you know, that this is going to, this was a traumatic event, a really scary event. And so, um, you know, we, our social worker helped us with, you know, some of the feelings that, that kids might have. They might be sort of irritable um, and that, you know, here's a resource where you can talk about this with your kids. And also, um, you know, we'll have extra support in the morning um, in all three of our buildings. And parents were really appreciative of that, too, to have some of the language to, to recognize what their um, students might be going through and to be able to talk about it. Mike, this is Tony. I'm, I'm glad you brought up the, uh, the decision, and I want to talk a little bit about whether or not do you release the students early, um, do, you, do you try to create some, some sense of uh, normal work to, uh, school day. Uh, just so everybody understands, right in the aftermath of this situation, uh, we had a uh, meeting with the Vermont State Police Command Staff, which included Colonel Birmingham, uh, myself, Captain Neil Martell, and, and uh, the superintendent. And that was a conversation that we had regarding uh, what should we do next steps, because keep in mind that the Montpelier High School also became uh, part, of, well, part of the campus was a crime scene. Um, we, we were going to have a, a flood of... Uh, special investigators from uh, to do work on the crime scene and it was uh, you know Brian's call uh, and Brian you can talk about that but again it was uh, it was discussed within the unified command but um, it was the, absolutely the right call in this situation and what was absolutely amazing to me was how we were able to kind of do two things at once one is again create as much of a normal environment for the school in terms of you know getting them to have lunch on time and then later, the cafeteria became really the command post for the crime scene processing, which continued till about 3 o'clock, I think, in the morning that, that the following day. Um, so, Brian, if you want to talk about that at all. And, and the, the, other, sure. the other piece I just want to add, too, is that, again, we still have a ton of press. Um, and 
one of the uh, a very valuable tool when you're trying to manage the press is as soon as you can pick which time you're going to do your press conference and where you're going to do that and we chose to do that at city hall um you know we gave ourselves a pretty tight window um and that includes the colonel myself and and, and brian uh, but again we wanted it away from the high school and uh so we did that we had a so we had a press conference that involved colonel birmingham uh, uh, Brian and myself, and we did not take questions. Also, uh, we just kind of went over the very basics of what happened, what the status of the school uh, was at that time, and then we ended it and we walked out. Yeah, Tony, thanks for for teeing that up for me. Um, I will share that my bias um, since I've been in school leadership has always been unless there is a really tight um, early release protocol that I know some of my colleagues have in some of their districts and supervisory unions, um, unless my hand is really forced, I would much, much rather keep students in school during the school day um, and not send them home to an unknown and not have to force parents' hands in terms of scrambling for child care, and my my worst fear is sending sending children home to a home that has no responsible adult there. Um, so so I was very you know again I because I, I'll say it again because of my very close working relationship with Tony, I feel very empowered to be as candid as I possibly can be in these conversations. And so I said to Colonel Birmingham right away. I said, number one, my inclination is to keep students here unless you're telling me that having students here is going to be a hindrance to your investigation. Um, and, you know, the other thing that I brought up to the colonel is if I do uh, schedule some kind of early release, only about half, and Mike can speak to this, Mike McCrace can speak to this, only about half of our students are driving to school. That would also mean in this situation we would be deluged with traffic with parents coming to the school to pick them up. Um, all of those logistics we could have handled if the Colonel and Tony had said to me, yeah, you know what, Brian, we need the kids out of here. We need to secure this entire building. Absolutely, we'll figure that out. But neither one of them said that. And in fact, when I brought up the consideration of parents coming to the parking lot um, and to the school, um, both Colonel Birmingham and Tony thought that that was not a good idea. And since we had just gone through lunch and since we had an established another room already for law enforcement to begin processing the investigation, we were essentially able to give law enforcement our tech room, which includes a classroom and what those of us who are old enough on this call would remember is what would be a, a wood shop the entire cafeteria and a third room, our faculty lunch room. Um, so given the fact that lunch was over, the timing worked out well that we weren't using essentially the last third of our first floor hallway, a hallway that includes central office and um, uh, facilities, law enforcement was able to continue to do their work in an area that would not disturb the school day. Um, no one would be coming down there. We didn't have any more classes in that classroom. We were able to make another faculty room available for our teachers, and we, had, we were finished serving food. So, um, again, my bias is unless it's a real, real serious situation, I don't want to send students home early. Um, I was clear with that, both with Colonel Birmingham, who I had met 30 minutes earlier, I was very clear, you know, and Tony has always empowered me to speak up and say what's best for the schools. Um, and so we were able to make what I consider to be a really thoughtful decision because the reality was our parking lot was already pretty full of law enforcement vehicles in addition to the regular vehicles that were already there. And a number of vehicles um, had evidence um, that needed to be secured anyway, so weren't going anywhere. Um, so that's my bias. As I said, I'm sure that I know that there are other colleagues of mine in the state who have very tight um, early release procedures, you know, to give folks on the call some context. We only bus students to our elementary school. We do not have busing for our middle school and our high school. Um, we've worked with our bus company 
um, to come up with contingency plans should we need to bust in the case of a hazmat or an environmental emergency. Um, and it's not great. I mean, what we would need is our bus company would essentially be trying to call as many buses that are available as they can to transport somewhere between, if we all three of us had to be evacuated, 1,100 and 1,200 students away from campus. Um, and we were ready to make that call if need be. But um, for me in that situation, unless either Colonel Birmingham or Tony was saying to me, yeah, Brian, you know, you got to get these students out of here. Um, I was going to say as much as possible, could we please at least get through the rest of the day, which by that point was only an additional hour, well, maybe it was closer to two and a half, three hours as the incident ended, I think somewhere around noon. Brian and Mike, we had a quick question from the field, and I think I know the answer, but the question was, how do you notify parents or folks that may be making deliveries uh, that are parked in your parking lot when the school gets put into lockdown? How do you notify those, or how do you gather folks that may be on athletic fields or notify them uh, that something is going on, uh, you know, inside the school and it's not safe to come back to the school? Um, in talking with Matt Nisley, I understand that you know a, a uniformed cruiser when a, when the school is in lockdown is an indication that folks shouldn't come to the school. But a lot of folks don't have that capability where it may be 15, 20, 25 minutes uh, before law enforcement gets there. Um, you know, I know there are some schools in the state that have gone to beacons and blue beacons or red beacons on the exterior portion of the school or putting signage up in the windows as they're getting their school into lockdown, those types of things. I think we have to be creative, um, but also understand when they get to the locked door and nobody's coming to the door, there's a reason for that. Um, and and, and yeah. the all call and the mass notification systems to parents that, hey, the school's in lockdown and, and you know, they should know what that means for their, for their community. Yeah. I, I think uh, I think this is a really good question because um, the one example of what you're saying is, uh, you know, our driver's ed uh, car was out. Mm -hmm. And so they couldn't get it back onto campus for like three hours. Mm -hmm. And... Um, because the teacher um, had his cell phone with him um, and Brian's uh, alert now messages, you know, go to the teachers as well. They're on that list. Um, he did have the message. Um, and but uh, I think the I think the blue light is probably an idea. We don't have that. Um, and I think, uh, you know, that might be worth investigating. And uh, I, I think that there's probably more that we could do to communicate. And um, we, we do have the good fortune of, of having somebody, a, a cruiser, uh, out at the end of the driveway really quickly. Um, and if we didn't have that, um, we might have had whatever the, um, the bagel guy come in here or something. And um, I, th I think it's a good question for all of us to consider how, how we can um, put the word out uh, as comprehensively as possible to, to those vendors and, and folks that might be off campus. Mike and Brian, can you, can you both talk a little bit about once the unified command process got put into place, you know, how the collective decisions were made? Was it literally folks uh, in the room, those relationships are established and we're feel, feeling comfortable making the decisions in the lanes of authority and responsibility that we're in? Yes, absolutely. You know, I, I can't say it enough. Um, Tony has empowered me since meeting me, and we didn't even have our first incident for almost a full year into my superintendency. Um, but he has always ensured and encouraged me to speak as candidly as possible given the circumstances. Um, my voice isn't equal in the sense that while I have zero training in law enforcement, um, I'm grateful that all of the law enforcement officials that I interact with view me as a professional in leadership and in education and as someone who only speaks in those situations as having the best interests of students and faculty and staff. And so I, do, I know for a fact that when I speak, what I say carries weight. Um, I also, as I said earlier in the call, I know that in the course of this situation, which was the first live one that I went through, that until called upon, I am on the periphery. Um, and I am very comfortable staying in that lane. I'm very comfortable admitting that I have zero training in law enforcement. Um, I'm very comfortable standing by. And when a law enforcement official speaks to me and asks a direct question, 
they get a direct prompt answer and continue on in terms of the work that they are doing in, in the unified command. Um, and as I said, um, when, we made, when Tony made the decision to have a press conference, the first thing I said is, I'll come with you. And he and Colonel Birmingham agreed that it would be good to have somebody from the school at that time ready to go. So for my school leadership colleagues who are either on the call or um, are listening to this call being recorded, it's critical in these situations that folks see educational professionals um, and educational professionals are able to speak to the procedures that happened in the building as impassionately but with empathy and compassion as we can. Um, like Mike said, we got a lot of praise for the amount of communication that went out. And, and I'll tell you that I also sent a follow-up email about 4.30 that afternoon to our families. So really it was three messages and a press conference, which, which were the sum total that day, besides interviews with the media, of, of our external, of our internal communication to our stakeholders. And the other piece that's a really important takeaway from all of this is as long as law enforcement clears your information, share as much rationale for the decision making as you can. Um, you know, I've used this example a lot and I use it with a mundane example like snow days. In my early years as superintendent, my message would simply be out to our families, schools closed, snow day, or something very short. I now share more rationale as to why. The forecast is telling us this. We're worried about releasing, having to release kids early. The more that you can share with people who are in a 24-hour news cycle, who get information from many, many outlets besides us, the more rationale that you can share in my experience, and I would add this experience in as well, the better folks are going to receive. They do want to know the whys for decisions that are made. Mike, as far as the, the, the student population the day after and the weeks after, yeah. was, was there a feeling of, um, you know, that, that it's not safe to be there? Was there a feeling like we've got this and acted appropriately? What, what was the, the communication and kind of the undertone with your faculty and staff and students after this incident? Yeah, I think there's an element of shock and just trying to name that for students and then, um, you know, continue to communicate with the faculty because they're the ones that really are taking care of the kids, you know, all day, you know, that they're, they're the ones in contact with them. So, you know, uh, I asked faculty to cut kids a little slack and to monitor them and then to, you know, refer kids as needed down to our guidance and social worker and nurse um, or, or myself um, and just any kids that might have a little extra TLC. And I would say that that was probably overshadowed by a real strong feeling of, of sadness, um, just finding out that there's a member of our community um, who uh, had been involved in the incident and, and who died. And so I think um, there was just a lot of sadness that ended up being kind of the predominant emotion um, in the following couple of days and, and not uh, fear, um, fortunately. And I think part of that is because they, the kids felt like um, everything responded in a way that they could understand. And, you know, when I say that we had um, good feedback about a lot of the communications, I don't mean, like, because we did such a good job. I, I share that because um, I, it's one of the lessons that I learned. I wasn't really sure if I was over-communicating or... Uh, or not, and just based on kind of leaning into the communication rather than leaning away from it seemed to be what um, people responded well to. And, you know, just quickly before we, before our time is up, there's some things I felt like I didn't do very well, and one of those things was, you know, for years I felt like our radios weren't very good, but we just kind of, oh, well, well, you know, they're okay, they kind of work. Well, we are definitely getting new radios. I mean, they're ordered, and I want uh, much better radios. So I'd say if there's like these little things that you know aren't great, um, when you're when the pressure's on, you don't want it to to fail. You don't want it to be a problem. So um, there's a few things uh, in in our calls, the the way that we made our calls to our students that. Um, we want to improve, and also um, the radio piece was, was definitely an issue for me. 
Um, so, uh, yeah, I think the, the overall feeling was a, a sense of, of sadness rather than fear and just being um, upfront about that and not sort of hiding it or, or moving away from it. And I, I, lastly, I will say you asked a question to, that Brian answered and I agree with about communication, but there's a lot of sort of privilege baked, baked into um, our situation. It was really lucky that um, Brian is in the building. In a lot of places, the superintendent isn't going to be in the building. Um, and so, like, you know, I would just encourage administrators to, you know, be on the cell phone maybe for, like, an you know, extended periods of time so that you can have a collaborator um, in, in someone who's right with you, even if they're not physically with you. And also, um, because there was such a heavy response from uh, the police and, and teams, there were times where I wasn't sure who I was supposed to be talking to, and I, I'm sure that that is just natural, and it was fine. Everyone was very responsive and, and helpful, but there were a few moments where I, I, you know, I'm not sure who makes what call um, in that side of things and, and the hierarchy of things. And really what we were able to do, which again is just good fortune um, based on our situation, is just rely on those relationships that we have um, with our local PD. And that's what we did and that worked great. Um, but I would say for some places you might not be able to, to do that. And so maybe having a, like a designated person or two that is like, all right, ask the questions to this person um, might be useful. Mike, th thank you for that. I I know that over the last couple of days, especially after Florida and after the Fairhaven incident, there have been a number of principals and superintendents that have sent out communications to parents and to students just about um, you know, how to take that community caretaking approach and the mental health resources yeah. that are available in schools uh, to deal with trauma-specific incidents that, that folks are going through and those types of things in their schools. And there are just a ton of resources that have been put together on the Vermont School Safety Center's website that, uh, that provide some guidance and, and some information if, if folks are struggling about the messaging that should go out to our parent community. I know the Secretary of Education also put up some information at the end of last week about some boilerplate and, and templated information uh, that should be utilized. I know that also the Secretary sent out a, a, a memo to all of Vermont's press uh, and, and media outlets, encouraging them to be sensitive that when these incidents are ongoing, that the role that they potentially can play in, in having a negative impact on the investigation and the response and asking for their sensitivity and the information that they put out may have a, a significant uh, impact on people being able to respond appropriately and those types of things as well. So she has been very proactive in asking for the assistance from, from the media as well. Just want to remind folks of a couple of trainings that are, are coming up and we're going to prioritize for this coming summer. Uh, incident command training for executive leadership as well as crisis communication. Both of those two or three hour classes that can be delivered, delivered locally to you and to your supervisory unions, as well as the importance of the threat assessment process. I can't speak strongly enough about um, a capacity within your systems to evaluate uh, threatening types of behavior and, and doing those assessments and putting those pieces of thread together so that we can mitigate and interdict uh, potential violence that may, that may come into our schools and how very important that process is as well. And there is, a, again, a, a template uh, question uh, that kind of prods thinking about how the threat assessment process is supposed to work. And the last resource I will share is there's a school emergency uh, preparedness guide for parents and guardians that is at the Vermont School Safety Center's website that if you're struggling to, to find information and verbiage to send out to parents about what they should or, more importantly, what they shouldn't do during an emergency, please share that with them as well. Mike and, and Brian, Chief and, and Matt and, and Emily, I appreciate the, the time spent. If folks have additional questions that you'd like to ha have answered from any of our participants, please email those to me and we can get those back to you <coughs> offline. And again, reminding folks that hopefully in the next couple of days we will get a link 
um, that will be this recorded conversation that if you need to share that with ad additional members in your community, those will be available as well. Brian, anything uh, in finishing comments? No, you know, I think um, I, I want to give Mike McCrae more credit than he's trying to deflect away from the, the in-person assembly at the end for me is a brilliant takeaway. And I would encourage all um, of my leader, educational leadership colleagues to think about that seriously. It's a chance in person to get questions answered, to try to um, get the truth out, the truth that we are able to tell um, in coordination with law enforcement. Um, and as Mike said, it's eyeball to eyeball. He um, very humbly admitted to me, um, I just started to make an, you know, read um, a prepared statement over, over the loudspeaker as he was letting the, the school know that they were off lockdown. And he said, and it just came out, um, you know, for everybody to go into the auditorium um, to have an assembly. And I think that's a really powerful way for a school leader to show his or her school leadership after something that's really scary for the school community. And it brings a real sense of family and a real sense of community and a real sense of I've got this um, for both the adults and the students. And so um, I do give Mike a lot of credit for that. And, and I'll, I'll end where I began. It's about relationships. Whether you know your first responders by name or you don't is going to make a difference. Um, we're very fortunate in our location. If we call 911, I, I, you know, we're going to see a police car immediately, if not already having Matt on one of our campuses. Um, but that doesn't preclude building great relationships, regardless of how far away or how close your first responders are. And, and it's a real credit to our first responders who have always treated me like a professional, not a second-class citizen, who have utilized our expertise who sit with us and do drills with us regularly and who are accessible to us. So for all of our law enforcement partners who are on this call, um, it's important that you're communicating um, in words and in actions that you see us as real partners. We defer to you. Of course we defer to you in these situations. Um, and it's important that you defer to us and hear our expertise as educational professionals because that really empowered me throughout this entire situation. Thanks, Brian. Mike, anything else? Closing comments? Oh, um, just to say thanks, everyone. I really appreciate it and appreciate all your support. Um, th thanks for, for uh, talking, let, hearing us out on this. Just want to remind folks that uh, you know, the Commissioner of the Department of Public Safety in a press conference last week um, it, it advised that law enforcement will be getting out into the communities uh, that we have jurisdictional authority of and trying to spend some time during their school safety drills in the month of March. So I would anticipate for the law enforcement folks on the call that there will be some guidance coming out from the Department of Public Safety about a couple of things and conversations we'd like folks to have with our schools during that time frame. So schools that are on the call, I would anticipate and expect that law enforcement would be calling sometime soon to try to find out the dates for those exercises so that there can be a collaboration for that. As always, uh, if folks need additional information, you've got my email. You can call our cell phone, call Emily at, uh, at Vermont Emergency Management. Again, Tony, uh, Matt, and Mike, and Brian, and Emily, thanks so much for partnering in this call. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.